I will not get the same standard error. R squared will be the same, n will be the same, k will be the same, but it's this guy over here that's not going to be the same. TSS, recall, is the sum of y i minus y bar squared. Okay, so if I flip x and y around, this term over here changes. My the other variable gets plugged in. So really, really interesting and unusual and an, an unusual feature about regression models is that your R squared value is the same <coughs> when you flip x and y. You kind of hint at a bit of what's really going on there. So here's what you need to take away from it. R squared is nothing more than the linear relationship between these two variables. That's all it's judging, is the, the degree of linearity between them. The stronger that degree of linearity, the higher your R squared value. Nothing more. You cannot judge whether a model is good for anything based on its R squared. All it's judging is the degree of linearity. Here's another thing I'd like you to take away from uh, this particular plot. When you guys learned regression in your stats course, did you use the terminology independent variables and dependent variables? Okay, please forget that. That's really, really bad terminology. You would have said, which one, is, which one of these two is the independent variable? Millivolts or temperature? Which is the independent? Voltage and which is the dependent? Okay, so here's why that's bad terminology. Independent implies that it's the millivolts causing the temperature. Right? That's the usual implication of this independent. This independent variable is causing the dependent variable. Or, if you want to say it another way, the dependent variable, it depends on the independent variable. So here, temperature is depending on the millivolts. From a, a common sense point of view, is that is that a fair thing to say? What's causing what in this, in this system? Temperature is causing the change in the millivolt that you're measuring. Okay, so in this case, in a, from an implementation point of view, temperature is the thing that's independent, causing a change in the millivolts. So that type of terminology is really counterintuitive in many situations. What's independent and what's dependent doesn't match with what's going on in reality. So let's not use that confusing terminology. Let's just simply say, recognize that when I'm doing something along the lines of temperature is equal to B0 plus B1 times my voltage, let's just call this my input variable, and let's just call this my output. <coughs> and recognize that all that we've got here is a black box that simply connects, takes my input in, and spits out an output for me. So it's simply nothing more than just a model. So in modeling terminology, let's just use inputs and outputs. Let's not use independent and dependent, because very often what's independent and is not really what's independent in practice. So it's really bad terminology, that and, and um, Again, it just comes from people who are not really thinking of what they're doing. So, so that's what I wanted to cover there. Here's another good example of that. What is the, are the cameras causing deaths or are the deaths causing cameras? Cameras are causing deaths. Okay, so, so, let's not use independent and dependent. So many situations where that terminology can be very confusing. Um, especially when cause and effect really is at play, or not at play. So today's class really, what we're going to cover here is we're going to look at some of these assumptions that we, we, we mentioned earlier on. And essentially, we won't go into too many details because when we go into looking at by how much these assumptions break down and what their effect is on the model, is really a whole topic on itself. It can easily be a, a, a full course. Um, I'm going into the analysis and the mathematics behind this. So what I will do, however, is we'll, we'll look at some of these assumptions in some very high level detail. And the reason for that is because at the end of the day, least squared is pretty robust to violations of these assumptions. And that's why it works so well. You may not have realized that all these assumptions are required to use a least squares model. And in many of your models that you've built in the past, from your lab reports and so forth, they probably violated one or more of those assumptions quite significantly. Yet the least squares model has been of some use. 
So we, we use this term that the model is robust. And there's a whole study in the stats world of levels of robustness um, and looking at that. So we won't go into those details, but we will cover a few of the, a few of the concepts. Um, and look, I'll just show you a few examples. So the reason why we want those models, why we want those assumptions to hold is when those assumptions hold, we can state the following, we can get the variance of my intercept, the variance of my slope, and the variances of y. Or in other words, the variance of my residuals, which is the standard error. So these, we first actually need to calculate the standard error. That goes into this equation up here, which is my variance of e1. And standard error goes, and also goes up into the first equation to get me the variance of my intercept. So if those assumptions hold, then those variances are accurate reflections of the true population variances. Okay, so this is why we want these assumptions to hold. The moment they hold, we've got an accurate estimate of the variances, and then I can go ahead to the next step and put their confidence intervals for V0 and V1. So we kind of look at it a bit the opposite way around. The last class we looked at deriving those confidence intervals. This time we're saying, well, the number of assumptions were made. What, what are they and what happens when they break down? Essentially what happens when those assumptions are violated is that these standard errors that you see up there get larger than they normally would otherwise be. So that's problematic because what happens is my confidence interval span gets larger than it would otherwise be. And that can lead me to saying certain slopes are insignificant when they really are significant. So this, that's why this is, this is why we're looking at this. So here's the reasoning. If these assumptions are violated, these standard errors are bigger than they otherwise would need to be, and my confidence intervals would be broader than they would otherwise need to be, leading me to make misleading judgments from my model. We don't want to do that. So how do we judge, uh, assess those assumptions? Well, let's take a look at, at, at two of them, uh, a few of them. But before I get there, I just want to talk a bit about one other use of the standard error, and that's to make a prediction interval for y. So here's a new line added to the slide. It's, if you get it down, you get it down. It's not that critical. But the main part to recognize is that my prediction of y comes from my model. And I've got a beta 0 plus beta 1x. I estimate beta 0 by b0. I estimate beta 1 as b1. And I plug in my new x value. So I've built my model offline ahead of time from some data set. Now I've got a b0 and a b1. Let me go use my model. I bring in a new x. Let's call it xi. And I make a prediction y. We want to understand by how much am I in error on my prediction. So what is the error related with y hat? And my residuals tell me that. My residuals tell me you're going to be within error by that value S E, which is why we want the standard error to be small. So we get a smaller prediction error. And a good initial guess for what your prediction error is is simply plus or minus two times that residual error, standard deviation. What that means geometrically is go up two standard errors on your regression line. So here's my regression line in red. Go up two standard errors, go down two standard errors, and draw lines parallel to your regression line. And that band is a band that contains 95% of your residuals. Okay, so if you're in a hurry and you don't need to calculate an accurate estimate for what that Y prediction error is, this is good enough. It's actually an excellent prediction of what that bound is. But here's the problem. This breaks down. It does not make sense to draw these parallel lines all the way. For the simple reason that if I bring in an x value over here at plus 20, is my prediction error still really plus or minus four times the standard error? So now I'm using my model far outside where it was originally built. It's really not <coughs> sensible to say that my prediction error band is still four standard errors up and down all the way as I go up and up with x, or as I go lower and lower with x, this bound should also not stay. We expect these bounds to get broader and broader the further we get away from where our model was built. So having parallel bands is good enough 
as long as we're in the region where our model was built, but far away from my model space, it's not sensi sensible for those bands to still remain parallel. We must, and we expect a broadening of those error bands. So a more appropriate derivation is in the course textbook. Let's not go through that, it's, it's pretty messy. And the end result is the following. But it still gets me, um, still gets me a good estimate. That previous one still gets me a good estimate. Let's take a look. The true variance of the predicted y, given a new x. So I want to predict yi. I'm given a new xi. Take my xi that I want to predict from, subtract the mean, square that. This denominator term, notice it sums over j, it's not summing over i. It's important attention here. This denominator term is the summation of your raw data that you used to build the model originally. So every data point you used originally, those n data points, subtract them from the mean, square them. What's this guy in the denominator? Variance. It's a scalar multiple of the variance of your raw x data. So we're seeing this term come again. We saw it last class, we're seeing it now again. So this is a constant, it's fixed for a given data set. Xi, this numerator term, is different. Every time for a different xi value, you subtract it from the mean and square it. This means that if in the previous example I wanted to calculate the prediction interval when x was 20, so up here, I wanted to check my prediction interval when x was 20. That is the value for xi that I go and use. Subtract from the mean of my, my data set, divided through by this constant variance multiple, plus 1 over n, plus 1, then multiply by the model standard error. So when you add a new xi, do you update x to an n? No, no. This is, the model's built, the model is fixed. So you've got your n data points that you used originally. Now you're simply going to reuse your model over and over in the future. Every time you use your model in the future, new xi, new xi, new xi. You make the prediction of what the variance of yi is. So your denominator term is essentially a constant. So denominator is constant. Once you've built your model, that term is fixed and remains fixed. Okay, so you can calculate everything in this expression ahead of time, except obviously xi, which is the, your, new, your new value that you're getting. So you can see that when we make that approximation that of plus or minus two times standard errors here in the previous slide, all I've done is I've ignored this terms over here. I've set this all to zero, and I've said that that's approximately or is zero, and I've just used standard error. Okay. So what this equation is doing is saying, well, no, the standard error isn't that. It's it's a little bit larger than you think. You add this term to it and this will blow this up. So if anything, just using standard error only as your plus or minus two times standard error is an underestimate of your prediction error. This is always going to make it bigger than what you think. Interestingly, the minimum value that you can get here for this variance is when xi is equal to x bar. Okay, so the minimum prediction error that you get is when your new x is at the center point of your original model. Every x away from that, above or below, is going to inflate this and make this get larger and larger. So what you end up with is a quadratic shape. It's a quadratic expression up there, and it shows that your prediction error gets wider and wider as one moves away from the model center. So if you look at this, it's not very clear, the quadratic nature of it, unfortunately. It's it's hard to illustrate this. It's such a weak quadratic function that it looks almost linear from the back of the class. But there is a bit of a curvature to the slides, and they get more pronounced as you get further and further away. Okay, so the, mid, the midpoint is here by the star, x bar. That is the point where the, these two lines are the closest together. After that, they deviate and get further and further apart. So that's the accurate estimate for, for y. And because it's such a weak quadratic function, it's good enough as a first guess to simply use plus or minus two standard errors and just go ahead with parallel lines. Is that clear? For future plots? No, Q 
if you plot a dose confidence interval of one This is a this is a, a pretty messy derivation to get to that point. It's in the course notes as well. Okay, so what I'll move on to next is let's take a look at when those assumptions break down. And it will lead to an investigation on data transformations. We'll look at a bit of leverage, outliers, influence, and discrepancy. What, what, what do those four words mean? We'll look at that in the next class or two, and then linear regression when we've got multiple next. So the first one, one key assumption is we, we have to assume our residuals are normally distributed. And if they're not normally distributed, what happens is that standard error gets larger than it would otherwise be. So very, very easy to detect this one. The only way to detect reliably is a QQ plot. Do not look at a histogram of your residuals. You often see this advice given in textbooks, is look at your histogram of the residuals. If your, that histogram looks normally distributed, um, you're okay. But the truth is the human eye cannot pick up heavy tails. And it's the heavy tails that cause you to overestimate what standard error is. So we cannot pick up heavy tails very well by our eye. Nor can we plot data in time series order and pick up normally distributed values either. I proved this to you in a previous class uh, where I had data that was not normally distributed and it very much looks normal on a, on a time ordered plot, but it's not. So don't rely on your eye in a histogram or in a time series order. Only a QQ plot is a, is a reliable way. So very easy to check, but it's not something that people often do, um, yet, it's, yet it's pretty trivial. So what we do then, if we do detect um, points lying outside the confidence bounds on the QQ plot, we remove them, that's one option, or we transform the Y variable. So I'll show an example of that next. Or we can go and add additional terms to the model. We'll see that, that's why we look at multiple regression later on, is because that's one way that we can get our errors to be normal. I cannot stress this enough, actually. The residuals are the most important part of the model. It's counterintuitive. You would think that the most important part of your model are this slope and this coefficient, the two things you've gone and calculated. But I will argue in every data analysis case that the residuals are your most important piece of information that you want to investigate. What is it that you want to see in the residuals? Trend, no apparent trend. We're looking for the absence of trends. There must be no structure remaining in the residuals. This step does not does not only apply to least squares. Every single model. So for those of you that go on and look at other models in the future, like principal component models or Bayesian models or um, neural network models, every time we investigate those models and look at the residuals, we're always doing the same thing. We want to see an absence of structure. And that's really hard to test. How do you test for something that's not there? Right. So what it ends up being is just looking at the data in multiple plots. So that's what we're going to see coming up next, is the only way to detect structure in residuals is look at different plots of the residuals, plot it against different variables. And if we see structure in those plots, then we know that there's something that's violating an assumption. So here's, here's one way to take, here's one example. This model was used originally to predict the price of a used car. So my Y that I'm aiming to predict is I'm taking the mileage that's on the odometer of the car and using only that variable, only that X variable, the mileage, I'd like to predict the price of that used car. So the structure of my model is price, <coughs> Price hat is equal to some intercept plus a slope term in one multiplied by mileage. And we compute the residuals, so a plot EI is equal to price known, so I know what the price of the car is when it's actually sold, minus the predicted price from the model, price hat. 
So residuals are easy to, easy to get after the fact, and those are the QT plot of it. What stands out in the QT plot is this very, very heavy tail. So notice this leaves the bounds for very many cars over here, leaves the bounds. But over here, we also see a fairly substantial cluster. And when we go and investigate those clusters, those cars up there are all Cadillac convertibles in the data set. I forget how many data points there were in this, in this data set. I can post them on the course website. It's, it's an interesting one. There's multiple variables in the data set, but if I only choose to use mileage to predict the price, I see the Cadillac standing out there quite significantly. So with the Cadillac observations remaining in the data set, my standard error is $9,700. So that's telling me my prediction error on the car price is pretty good pretty wide. If I go delete those, those rows, those couple of rows corresponding to Cadillacs, I get a slightly revised slope coefficient. Does this coefficient make sense? Clearly on the side. Does it make sense? Yeah, let's break them down. Let's go down, so that's a good thing. But notice what's happened. So we've gone from a more substantial increase in price per unit mileage down to something smaller. So the Cadillacs now have less, uh, now don't have influence on the model. This curve becomes slightly more normally distributed. We still have this tail to deal with, but the upper end now is not so, so distorted anymore. My standard error has been reduced, and my confidence interval has shrunk in the next, therefore, from one slope coefficient. So this uh, data set, you will never actually get as perfectly set perfectly set of normally distributed errors because there's so much more to influencing the price of a used car than just the mileage. Right, so that's this next aspect, this other aspect that I had up here. When we're dealing with, I've done one thing, I've removed outlying observations. But there's several other things I could do to transform the y variable. I could look at predicting not the price, but I could predict the log of the price or the square root of the price. That may make my residuals more normally distributed. But here is a third aspect which we'll come to later on, is add additional explanatory terms. So in that model, to get the residuals more normally distributed, you have to go add in some of the other columns that were in the data set, like the number of doors on the car. This is an important variable. Um, that helps to explain the price of the used car. Here's another example. So before, here's, here's my residuals from a particular model. Now, there's a bit of curvature that you start to notice here. So we see a bit of a bow shape in those residuals. What I can do is I can apply a square root transformation on y. So what I say in, in R is I say the square root of y predicting x ln. So you simply type that into R. Give me the linear model with the square root of y I want to describe the square root of y by x, or regress the square root of y onto x, is, is, is what that says. So you don't do anything new in R. You don't have to go take your y variable ahead of time and square root it yourself, and then go and put that new variable in and build a regular use for model. In R, it's very flexible. You simply tell it what the transformation is on x. It will take care of all the mechanics internally it will spit out a regression coefficient for you that's now essentially a model of y is equal to b0 plus b1 x. And you can go and interpret these regression coefficients and the confidence intervals for them in the regular way. So this is why it's so important to understand that output from the r function, from the ln function, because when you go and start to do these modifications now, everything else is interpreted in the same way. There's nothing new required on your side. So if you figure it out once, you've done it for all these possibilities that are going to come from the future. Okay, so that's, uh, that's an important transformation. Sometimes, I just also wanted to point out one other interesting transformation that, that always comes up, people ask me about, is how can I get R to fit me a linear model where the intercept is forced to zero? In many instances, you know the intercept is zero from a first principles point of view. So for example, if you were looking at the ideal gas equation and trying to predict pressure from temperature, 
we know that at zero temperature our pressure is zero. And that's just a physical physical phenomena. And many other chemical engineering processes, your x variable you choose, you you know that at, when that variable is at zero, your y must be zero. So to force R to build a model with an intercept of zero, you know that this is not going to work. You know that R is going to always fit an intercept there for you. So to force it to zero, you simply say x plus zero. That will force the intercept to zero. That's something that's good to know for since we're talking about R and transformations. Let's take a look at another assumption that's required. One, this is one of constant error variance. So constant error variance implies that the variability in Y is the same at all values of X. And one way we can pick it up is by plotting Y hat against the residuals. So my predicted value of Y plot it against the residuals. If I've got constant error variance, I should see these residuals staying roughly in the same band. Non-constant error variance most often shows up with a fan shape. So we're seeing this in this particular instance. My residuals get broader and broader as my predicted value of y gets larger. So this is an example of non-constant error variance over there on the right-hand side. Again, you have to be pretty extreme with non-constant error variance for it to really break down the least squares models. Pretty extreme, by that I mean your variance needs to span almost about three to five times from the one edge to the other edge for that, for that becomes a problem. So again, extremely robust to that assumption. So several ways of detecting it. Plot Y hat against the residuals as shown in the previous slide or plot x against the residuals. So either one of those two, y hat or x, plotted against the residuals should show that up. And you look for fan shapes or unusual regions of non-constant variance. Now we can counteract that. If it's a problem, we can use weighted least squares, where we say, well, if my residual is, is large, I'm going to downweight it. So you make your weights here, w, inversely proportional to the error. Inversely proportional to the variance of those errors. So you tell the model when, when fitting it, we normally just minimize the sum of squares of the residuals where each w here is 1. So you give equal weights to each residual. Now we say, well, let me downweight high residuals and upweight small residuals, and that will even it out. And so if you want the details of that, uh, Draper and Smith is a good reference to, to look at that. But we won't, uh, we won't get into this particular topic. R does this again for you very easily. You just give it a vector of weights and it will go do all the calculations for you. Here's another issue that often comes up in engineering processes, so let's talk about this one a bit more. We need independence between our data points, so our central limit theorem holds. And that central limit theorem is what was used in the confidence interval. So most of our processes as engineers are very, very slow moving. Uh, bioreactors, even petrochemical plants, food processing, all these systems are very, very slow. Very, very likely you're going to encounter autocorrelated data. And I still insist that we, 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 we shortchange our undergrads by not looking at a course on time series analysis at the undergrad level. But if you are interested in that and, and willing to self-study a bit, the Chatfield book is highly recommended. But let's talk about one topic on autocorrelated data that's that can really show how easy it is to pick this up. Again, R, R has all the built-in functionality here. So let's, uh, let's understand what I mean by this. So if I take my data set here, here's x and y. Let's assume I don't know whether there's autocorrelation or not. I've just collected this data x and y and I've built that predictive model and it looks pretty good. But when I go plot my residuals now in time order, I see the problem here. <coughs> Braden had said earlier that when you plot your residuals, you want to see no structure. What do we see out here on the residual plots on the right? Strong car 
correlation between successive observations. So around time 60 to 80, all of these residuals are, are negative. And around time 40 to 60, all my residuals are positive. Here's another region, here's another region. So very, very structured. There's no, there's no way you can say that that's a random collection of residuals. So here's one way to pick it up in R. Let me talk a bit about how this data was created. Um, and even though this data was created synthetically, pretty much any data set you take from a company, you can easily find this as a realistic example. So what, was, what, was, what happened here is that this data comes from the fact that x i plus 1 is equal to this constant phi x i plus some error. So this is how the data was created behind the scenes. My x values well, this, this, this subsequent x value is a strong function of the previous x value. And in this first illustration over there, that phi was 0.95. So there's a 95% relationship between subsequent from one x to the other. Very, very strong correlation between one x to the next x. So what the autocorrelation function does in R, so if I if I've collected my data x, so let me assume x is a vector of raw data. What I can do in R is I can just use the function called ACA, autocorrelation function, and give it the vector x. It will then plot for me this function up here, or this plot out here at the top. Okay, so what I've got here are three examples of that. The, the lower plot is my raw data. The upper plot is the output from the ACS function in R. And I've shown it to you for three instances. One with phi a very large positive, phi a moderate positive, and phi a strong negative. So let's just take a look at the first example. What this first plot does is it's showing you the autocorrelation of the variable. And for those of you who are comfortable with Greek, Probably most of you are not. Auto means self. So self correlated. So it's essentially a plot of the data correlation with itself. So the first spike over here, or first stem as it's called, is at zero. This is the correlation of the data with itself at zero lags. In other words, that zero, that lag there is referring to this i. So the lag is equal to i. So if I'm plotting i equals zero, lags equal to zero, I'm looking at the correlation of xi versus xi. And so that's essentially plotting r squared, sorry, it's r, plotting r of xi against xi, which is by definition going to be one. So that first spike at zero lags has height of one. The next spike at lag 1 is plotting r of xi plus 1 against xi. So that's the correlation of the xi plus 1 vector against xi. <coughs> so essentially it comes down to plotting xi on my one axis and xi plus 1 on the next axis. And I'm simply looking at the strength of that relationship there. And I'm recording what this correlation coefficient, R, just call, it, just call it the correlation coefficient between this xi quantity and xi plus 1. So it's going to be a number that's in this case around 0.95, for example. Then I go to the next lag, lag 2, lag 3, lag 4. And I'm plotting each stem corresponds to the successive amount of correlation. Okay, so what we see here is that the data points in this process are autocorrelated to a significant degree up to 16, 17 lags. So a data point now has a strong relationship to a data point 10, 12, 14, 15 samples later. It's only at about the 16th or 17th sample that those data points become independent of each other. Okay, so that's the key insight here. We want to find 
the point where our data are independent of each other. We know that lack of independence is a problem. Well, how can I detect it? I can use an autocorrelation plot. How do I know my data are independent? If in the autocorrelation plot, the only significant lag is the one at zero. The lag at time step one should be insignificant, and then I know my data are, are uncorrelated, independent of each other. So here I've got a small lag. There's only a 30% relationship between one observation and the next. I see that only the data point one lag away is related to the previous one. After that, these spikes are essentially random noise. If my autocorrelation is strongly negative, that in raw data form is a plot that often oscillates like that, indicating that one observation is negatively correlated to the next and then so forth. So you get this flip-flopping. That will show up as a negative spike. And then it dies away. Okay, so the autocorrelation plot is a phenomenally powerful plot to see how many samples does it take before one observation is unrelated to the next observation. What do the blue dash lines represent? The blue dash lines are theoretical confidence bounds that show when there's no correlation at all. There will always be some measure of correlation. Give me any two vectors, there'll always be a non-zero correlation, except for specially constructed. But any two random data vectors, you'll always get some measure of correlation. So those blue bands tell you where that starts to become significant and a certain level of confidence. So simply recognize then that this is saying my process is very strongly correlated up to about the 15, 16th lag. That means that if I need independent data and I've got my raw column on X, simply go to your X data set and sample every 17th row and throw away the intermediate data. Okay. Then you're guaranteed to have independent variables or independent observations. Excellent tool for subgroups because one of the issues we wanted in our Shua charts was what is the size of our subgroups that are needed so that they're independent of each other. This is telling how far we need to skip over to get that independence. A really, really easy to use function ACF, and it's doing something behind the scenes that you, you already understand. All it's doing is it's calculating the correlation between the same column of numbers at successive shifts, or successive lags. There is another, um, another way to test it, it's called the Dover Watson test. Again, that uh, is left for you to read if you're interested in that sort of topic. So we, we know that we've removed the independence from our system when the autocorrelation of Y and the autocorrelation of, of the residuals shows no significant lags, except for lag zero. Lag zero will always be 100% correlated. All the other lags should be within those kinds of lags. Why can't you just average that? Because then you still, I guess. So you, yeah, the problem is with averaging is you're, you're creating a smearing effect. So you're just blending a whole lot of data together. And then the risk is that your predictions from that smear data are going to be very, very weak. And rather than the But averaging does work in some certain instances. But in this case, I wouldn't smear so many, so many things together. Then, of putting out the fact that we have to assume that our model is linear. Now we know also that as engineers, over a large enough span, non-linearity starts to kick in for most of our systems. So the ideal gas flow is a good example of that. Over most ranges of temperature and pressure, we can have a linear relationship between those two variables. But at extremes, that linearity breaks down. We have to start accounting for it. But Let's recognize that the assumption of linearity is often good enough. So here's an instance where my model has a quadratic relationship between x and y. But if I'm only interested in using it over this region here in the center, that linear assumption, so when I build this linear model, is going to be a fair approximation. 
it's only if I use it over a wider range that it will start to break down. So let, let's, let's uh, recognize it. The Antoine equation is a good example of that. It's an extremely nonlinear function if you plot it over a wide range of temperatures. But over a small range, which is typical of most chemical processes, it behaves in a linear fashion, which is why it works so well as a predictive sensor in many companies. They'll simply implement it as a linear model in that range because it works good enough. We're not operating our plants over a very wide range. By definition, we want our chemical processes to operate over a narrow, stable region of operation. So it's only when we go to extremes that that model breaks down. And if we're operating in an extreme, we've got bigger things to be worrying about than our model's linearity. So let's, let's use this fact to our advantage and recognize we don't always need to apply transformations to our data. Very, very easy to detect non-linearity. Again, here, multiple plots, as I said, we're going to plot y hat against the residuals, or x against the residuals. So let's take this example, which I, I constructed to have a quadratic relationship between x and y. So we can already start to see that my linear model breaks down, without even looking at these subsequent plots. Just the raw data of x against y shows me some non-linearity. So I've already got that as a warning sign. But it shows up more dramatically when I plot x against the residuals, as I've suggested up there, or y hat against the residuals. I'll very clearly see this quadratic shape show up, telling me that I've got some significant non-linearity. How do I deal with it? Well, one way is to do non-linear v squares, where I build a, a non-linear model. So I'm not going to go through this detail. It's, it's really, I put in your notes there that it's too complicated for this course. It's not too complicated for this course. You could easily understand it. And it was, in fact, taught for many years in, in, at the fourth grade level. But it's really too much to go into to, for the time we have available. Furthermore, R does it pretty much automatically for you. So you can build these nonlinear models pretty much without any additional work. Here is another alternative of dealing with it that is more, more suitable, and you've probably been made aware of this on previous courses, is to take a transformation of x or y and then build a model on that transformed variable. So what I mean by that is take your original x variable and you raise it to the power of p. And then you use that transformed variable as your raw x. So instead of using your raw x here, you use this and send that into your use for this model. Now, that power p can be pretty generic. It can be a positive value or it can be a negative value. So if I go to higher powers, I'm obviously going to quadratic transformations, uh, sorry, squared transformations, cubic transformations. But if I go down to 0.5s to fractional values, I'm taking quadratics and so forth. And the log transform, the log transform is, can be approximated as p to the power zero in terms of its severity. So as p gets larger and larger, I'm going to make a more severe transformation. As p gets more and more negative, I'm again making a more severe transformation. The log transformation, while clearly p to the zero here is, is going to be a nonsensical transformation, I'm just going to get one that's coming out of it. But in terms of severity, the log transformation fits somewhere between a p of plus 0.5 and a p of minus 0.5 in terms of, of how severely it's going to happen. So if you put in a p-value, you look at the structure in this, in this plot over here, has that structure gone away, then you pay a successful transformation. If it's still remaining there, you go to more and more aggressive keys. You go, we call this the ladder of transformations. You go up with keys, you keep going down until you get to the 